Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here are your hosts, Joe Kuzma and Zach Meckler. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast. My name is Joe Kuzma, and today I am joined by a different brother from another mother. No, I did not lay off uh, Brian E. Roach, but you know what? He's earned a uh, well-deserved day off. So uh, line, making the planets align here and getting uh, together this time, usually you're with Brian, not the other way around. Although I know we have like our rotation that goes on, but a one, uh, prof- we call him the professor here. His name is Zach Meckler. Zach, what's going on? Just, you know, isolated and trying to keep myself quarantined here in the great city of Pittsburgh as this whole <laughs> pandemic starts to take over everything. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, uh, you know, not to get into anything that's news or politics or anything like that. It's like I see so much conflicting information. I don't know what to deal with. But we can't get into that type of stuff. Did you not know that uh, just like the football players, we're not allowed to have fun. We have to stick strictly to football. We have to stick to Steelers, too. We can't talk anything non-Steelers or else nope. you know, the people get all, all in a tizzy in the comments section. I know I went a little crazy and silly and off the rails, but come on. It's March. There's not a whole lot of football news. I mean, we can talk to what we're blue in the face about you know draft prospects and stuff but there's not really anything to talk about these guys aren't having pro days uh you know all there is is the combine nobody's visiting nobody's doing anything it's it, everything's come to a standstill yep and it's really unfortunate because this is the time of year i look forward to every single year where we get the guys who are doing well at the pro days we hear what teams are interested in who when it comes to uh pre-draft visits and interviews and things like that and i'm just sitting here twiddling my thumbs with no idea who's interested in what prospect, whether it's the Steelers or any other team. It's a really kind of uncharted territory that I'm not used to this time of year, and I'm trying to find ways to fill up my uh, draft-voided heart at the moment. Oh, I know. This is the this is the big one for you. If you don't know, folks, this, this guy right here, Zach, we call him the professor because – you have like spreadsheets that you keep all throughout the college football season. You have them for like, you have like archives of them and you do all of your own grading, all your own film and everything else, which is it's truly incredible. I don't have the time nor the patience to do that. Uh, particularly with college football now with pro stuff. I mean, I have more probably useless knowledge in this like teeny tiny brain of mine than I care to acknowledge. But, uh, you know, you have like so much, so much there invested in this. And I, I know it's eaten away at you for me. I'm like the lay person here when it comes to it. Like, uh, you know, I, I casually follow college football here or there. I know who some of the big names might be and stuff. I will admit I'm ignorant to some things. Mm-hmm. I try not to jump on trends or knee jerk reactions as I do with anything else. But this is where, you know, I hang my hat on. Oh, hey, they went, uh, they went to this guy's pro day. I remember Mason Rudolph was the one, and there was actually a photo with Mike Tomlin and Kevin Colbert that were there. And it was like, are they really looking? Look at they were like have uh, have your spouse look at you the way Mike Tomlin looks at Mason Rudolph if you remember <laughs> if you remember, remember that, yeah it was like a he was like grinning or something like that <laughs> I mean it was it was so cheesy and it was funny and then lo and behold look what happens and uh, along with you know James Washington too obviously they're there they're there to do take the whole picture and that's what ends up happening too is you're there to watch one guy. And who knows who were they were there? Maybe they were there to watch, you know, Washington and Rudolph and or whatever. But at the same time, it's like you might be there to watch one guy and end up seeing another, and that's how people get discovered. You got uh, guys that will end up sticking to teams as undrafted free agents, college free agents, and things of that nature. And what ends up happening is uh, they get seen by virtue of some other high-profile prospect at their school. Let's just say I, I don't want to throw out like Ohio State because that's like a real big one. But you know, like Oklahoma State, how many guys get drafted into pros? I understand still what a Big Twelve school and everything like that, but you know, at, at Division One or whatever, I understand with the smaller ones. But still, there's guys there that are going to be there. Let's say like a wide receiver just to catch passes from a, a quarterback that might be getting looked at, or vice versa. And then that's how people get like their camp invites and things like that. And none of that is going on, and nobody knows where anybody's going. And this is going to be certainly an interesting draft. And the NFL isn't budging or moving a date. You don't even know if guys are going to pass physicals or be healthy. You, you really don't know what kind of bag of goods you're going to end up getting. We talked about just in free agency here, Andrew Billings was a free agent, uh, formerly of the the Bengals. Where do you go? The Browns, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, figures. Anyways, <laughs> that guy was like a, a really – 
he, he was a favorite of ours. It, it was somebody that even myself I mocked as being the Steelers pick. He was going to be the guy, number one overall, however many years ago was that. Was that 2016? Is that the same year we're going to talk about, or was that 2015? That was 2016. Yeah, 20, huh? Yeah, it was 2016. Correct. 20, 2016, which we're going to talk about today uh, shortly. And I remember that was going to be the guy. And then, lo and behold, after the first day of the draft, the first round goes by, he doesn't go in the first round. And you're thinking, well, is it because he's a nose tackle? Is it because he's from Baylor? Is it because you had all these other things going on? And you find out he goes in, like, the fourth round because there was some type of medical red flag with a knee or something. And I don't even think he played his rookie season are very sparingly. And I think he ended up on injured reserve if I remember correctly. And those are the kind of things that, you know, this is the complete unknown. A guy like that could very well end up in the first round this year, because you're not going to know if anybody has like, has their clearances. Exactly. And that's, and that's a really big thing that, you know, draft Twitter is as critical as I am with them. You know, a lot of times you spend a lot of time just looking at the tape, looking at what they did when they were in college um, you hear some rumors that leak about interviews and things like that, but medical reg checks and character concerns are a big issue as to why these guys that have a first-round talent, second-round talent, end up falling well into day three, or sometimes even going undrafted. You have a guy like Lael Collins, who, you know, by all accounts, is the top offensive lineman prospect in that class, and he ends up going undrafted because of the potential involvement in a, in a homicide um, that his name was linked to, and it knocks a guy like him out. You know, you have, you have things like that happen all the time in drafts, and a guy like Andrew Billings, you never hear this come out anywhere about him having this knee issue whenever he was uh, coming out of Baylor. And then all of a sudden, bada bing, bada boom, he falls to the fourth round. And there's a guy who was considered to be the top uh, nose tackle prospect and one of the top D lineman prospects, period, in that 16 class, goes to the fourth round. And the Bengals, by and large, you know, get a guy who ends up pretty much being redshirted um, his rookie year in the NFL and ends up being a, a decent player for them. He was never elite, but, you know, not many nose tackles that that, that his or his size truly are elite from a, a statistical standpoint. But... That's a huge part that's being missed now with this whole concept of no pro days, no pre-draft interviews and things like that. That's really where these teams and these front offices and these coaches get the opportunity to really get to know these guys and see what type of player they're getting. I think that's going to benefit some of the seniors who had the opportunity to play at the East-West Shrine game and the opportunity to play at the Senior Bowl and the Combine even because that, those are guys who now have the opportunity to get three different exposures with teams that some underclassmen might not have had or some of the guys who were uh, the Combine snubs didn't really have a chance to get an opportunity to show, a show out on pro days and show out on pre-draft visits. So they're going to be the ones that are impacted the greatest. And I think you're going to see some guys that get stolen on the, on the third day of the draft or even go undrafted that end up making contributions for teams just because of the fact that you're going off of their tape. And yeah, their tape might be good, but you don't know who you're getting because you've had no exposure to them one-on-one. -on -one. And I think that's why seniors for the first time in a while, because we've seen kind of seniors start to fall off when it comes to the draft and a lot of these underclassmen that are coming out early that are the exciting young 20, 21 year old prospects are the ones that are getting looked at the most. They don't have the exposure to teams and teams are going to go off what they knew from the senior bowl with a lot of these guys and who they met at the combine with. That's really the only exposure you have. So It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. I think you're going to see a lot of guys falling or go early, and you end up seeing getting hurt early on because they might have had some medical or medical red flag that you didn't really hurt, hear about. So, again, it's all uncharted territory, and it's going to make this draft one that should be very interesting and potentially remembered by, depending on how this all pans out, because this is something that we've never seen happen to this manager that's going to directly impact the draft like this. Yeah, and I mean, uh, just talking about how much money you think that news cost Lyle Collins, I thought it was almost criminal oh, yeah. too that the Cowboys were able to just snag him. Uh, I was just I was looking over his contract, and you take a look at some of the cash paid. His first two years, he was barely making four hundred fifty six thousand, five hundred twenty six thousand, and then he got bumped up. They you know they started floating some money his way until he got his big contract in twenty nineteen, but twenty seventeen. Five million and four and a half in 2018. You look at Ronnie Stanley, who went sixth overall, also a, a tackle to the Baltimore Ravens. And Ronnie Stanley, let me see here. Uh, let's see. He had cash paid his first year was thirteen and a half million dollars total. Yep. Now I know some of that is guarantees and signing bonuses and whatnot. 
uh, 1.3, 2.3, and 3.2. He exponentially made way more money than Lyle Collins did uh, right out the gate. Now, Collins is averaging about 10 mil a year right now uh, based on the contract he signed last year. But, geez, it's just, you know, every just a little bit of a disruption, basically. And then, and these guys lose millions of dollars over it. It's, it's unfortunate. And these are the things that you're not really going to see, uh, you know, heading into unless somebody, you know, a picture of somebody with a bong surfaces or something like that, <laughs> which, you know, you've had some of those. And, I, you know, we're looking today, we're looking at that same draft class, by the way, the 2016 NFL draft. And it's kind of interesting looking at it, uh, going back and looking at it, particularly for the Steelers, but not just the Steelers, but overall looking and seeing some of the, usually you don't, you don't always have players that have done, let me say, amazing. First round picks aren't necessarily a shoe in but these top seven all, did something and at least been in the Pro Bowl for one reason or another or uh, even a Super Bowl appearance, although Carson Wentz, who was second uh, with Jared Goff going first overall to the Rams, uh, you know, Wentz gave way to injury to Nick Foles, but he still has a ring to show for, and he had a good season leading up to that. Joey Boza, Ezekiel Elliott, Jalen Ramsey, Ronnie Stanley, and DeForest Buckner, those are all great. Then you look at the next handful and you have Jack Conklin, Leonard Floyd, Eli Apple, uh, Vernon Hargraves, there's one we were talking about, right, uh, in the back rooms. Sheldon Rankins, and you get to 13. Laramie Tunsil, you have somebody there. Carl Joseph. Most of these guys aren't – if they're if they're still playing, that is. Uh, I believe everybody's still there, but they're not even like with their original teams. So Carl Joseph, now with the Browns instead of the Raiders. I remember he was somebody that I really liked. The Browns uh, ended up with Corey Coleman, who bounced around all over the place. Taylor Decker. Uh, Keanu Neal, who's been snake bitten with injuries, but with the Falcons has, has had a decent career so far. Uh, Ryan Kelly, center for the Colts. Then you go uh, Shaq Lawson, uh, Darren Lee with the Jets, uh, Will Fuller, Josh Doxson, Laquan Treadwell, and you get the pick 24 with the Bengals right ahead of pick 25 with the Pittsburgh Steelers, and then pick 26 with the Denver Broncos. So this is a this is an interesting pack of picks right here, and it talks about and what we're talking about today, as silly as it may seem, is the 2016 draft class, the Steelers and the NFL draft class. You kind of see how this panned out, and if you go back in time and you're looking. Uh, you look at this, and there's what one, two, three corners off the board so far. It was a no-brainer that the Steelers absolutely needed a a DB. It specifically, let's go get a cornerback. They hadn't drafted one in 25 years since Chad Scott, and they finally go and they go and get their guy. Except their guy, I think, went to Cincinnati with that pick right before theirs in William Jackson the third. And it's going to be interesting to see what goes on there in Cincinnati because they had signed and have like what, like 13 corners right now or DBs. So it just seems like there's only so much playing time. I mean, they already have Drake Kirkpatrick, William Jackson. Who else went there? Was it like Trey Waynes and somebody else that was a free agent? And uh, yeah, it was it was incredible amount of players. They were they were just collecting up like old Marvin Lewis bat basket of uh, defensive backs there. I mean they they've always been a collection, but they're just going over the top. Yeah, Trey Waynes was one. Um, you know, Drake or Patrick still there. Uh, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and they lost, um, oh. Mackenzie Alexander, another one. Forgot oh yeah. Him. Mackenzie Alexander was another guy that, you know, a lot of people were looking at. So, yeah. I mean, it's really crazy. And Mackenzie Alexander ends up going uh, after this pick. So, of course, William Jackson goes at 24. The Steelers get their guy, Artie Burns. Everybody's like, who? You know, we're talking about the pre-draft process and everything like this. Did they, you know, crap the bed? Did they panic? There were so many people that were just PO'd that they didn't go and get the future, the future at the quarterback position with Paxton Lynch. Isn't it weird how that, like, comes It comes about, uh, you know, full circle here, and now he's, you know, maybe competing for a spot with Doc Hodges, who was undrafted last year. And a lot of people will look at this in hindsight and say, well, there's all these other guys like Robert Kemdichi, and that's been interesting, and uh, you know Emmanuel Ogba, and there's so many other guys. I know Xavier Howard is the one that 
you know, we talk about who who scouts for what and how you could get things right, how you could get things wrong, who looks like a good fit with what system and who who's all in leadership positions in the organization and making the decisions and you know, that's how all these things end up all over, you know, and it, hindsight's 2020. 20. You could go back and look and see, "Oh, well, hey, look, Derrick Henry goes a 45 uh, to the Titans and uh, Michael Thomas goes 47 to the Saints." They could have had either of those guys, but they have a need for those positions. They had an overwhelming sense of urgency to go and draft a corner. And, you know, the way Artie Burns' career kind of panned out, uh, yeah, he's no longer a stealer, nor are any of the guys we're going to talk about today. This whole draft class has kind of flown the coop for one reason or another. And this is, we're going to look at how this really impacted the Steelers because they go out and get Artie Burns. And, you know, I thought he was okay. The first, you know, rookie season was okay. He finally worked himself onto the field. And, you know, he played some of his second season, and then he started to regress. But I think this also forced the Steelers' hand in other ways because, uh, you know, if Artie Burns pans out, do they still make the same kind of move to get Joe Hayden? Do they make the same kind of move in the future to get Steven Nelson? And does their defense look the same, at least that defensive secondary? And we're going to talk about this with their next pick too. Uh, you know, I, I think this, this draft class – whether it was positively or negatively, definitely influenced where the Steelers' defense is 2019 and heading into 2020. Oh, 100%. I think you'll get a guy like Artie Burns, which you know I, I admittedly was high on Artie Burns coming out. I'm not saying that retrospectively. I had him in kind of the same bracket as Xavier and Howard where they were two guys that I thought were going to have a chance to sneak into the first round. Um, I thought they were very much traits-based prospects that – you know, just needed to kind of grow some and get to that point. Obviously, we've seen Xavier and Howard do that, and he's kind of developed into a shutdown corner, pro ball level corner, and Artie Burns didn't never really made that jump with Pittsburgh, and I hope the best for him with Chicago. But, you know, they both were guys that a lot of people, especially in the draft Twitter community, thought were going to go much later in the second or third round. And I know I had, mar- I had mocked Artie Burns to the Steelers in the second round that year. Um, but I just – the signs were all there that he was a guy they were targeting. I don't – I, I don't really believe that it was a, a nervous, you know, for panic pick whenever William the Jackson III went off the board the pick before. I think Artie Burns was the guy they were considering. I do believe that uh, WJ3 would have been the pick um, had he been there at 25. I think he was the guy they were targeting all along. Um, but, you know, it, it's not a surprise. He was a traits-based guy that was raw coming out, and so was Xavier Howard. And one of the guys just ended up, you know, developing quicker. Um, but you, you see Artie Burns not panning out. You can make the argument that if, they, he, if he pans out and turns into the first round corner that they invested on him, you don't see Steven Nelson in Pittsburgh right now. There's no need to pay Steven Nelson $8 million or $9 million a year when you have Artie Burns on a rookie contract playing at a top level opposite of Joe Hayden. So you really that his inability to develop and take that jump in year three and year four to be the lockdown corner they were hoping he would be with his athleticism and ball skills. You don't see ne- Steven Nelson here and realistically – uh, there's a chance Joe Hayden doesn't even end up here because you need a number one corner at that point. Joe Hayden becomes available and you give him a big contract. He's your number one corner. You know, So now by having those two guys there on contracts for the next two, three years, you don't have a reason to lock up Artie Burns long term and sit there impatient waiting for him to gain his confidence back and make the jump. And you're alluding to it's the same thing with uh, Sean Davis. I mean, Sean Davis, I think, had a better career in Pittsburgh than Artie Burns did by far. Um, but I, I still think that he was never going to be – that dude that they wanted him to be. I mean, I, I had hopes for him. He was another guy where I was high on coming out, and I had mocked into the Steelers a couple of times in the second and third round, but uh, he just never made that jump. And you can make the argument if he doesn't get hurt last year um, and if it doesn't become explicitly clear that he's not going to be the guy, and Minka Fitzpatrick, that casually, that conveniently doesn't become available, Minka Fitzpatrick's not a Steeler. Because why do you make the trade for a guy like Minka Fitzpatrick or signing a guy like Steven Nelson when you have a first and second round pick that are playing a potentially Pro Bowl caliber uh, talents on the field. There's no need to make those moves and give up draft capital or give up big chunks of contract space and salary whenever you have that opportunity to get two guys like that. So really, the inability for Burns and Davis to kind of take the jump and be the guys the Steelers had envisioned is really what kind of <laughs> led the Steelers to potentially, in my mind, have an upgraded secondary. It didn't come conventionally via the draft like you'd hope them to, but you have now Steven Nelson, Joe Hayden, and Minka Fitzpatrick, which I'll take every day of the week and twice on Sundays if that's what it takes to <laughs> Twice, to get that second back there. Twice on Mondays and twice on Thursdays too, Thursdays, right? Well, exactly. 
100%. You know, and I'm trying to look at this. You you jumped the gun on me, but that's okay. We had to bring up Sean Davis. A lot of people, he's kind of the forgotten guy because he got injured last year. Uh, You know, he was was banged up. I, I think he left the New England game early. And then came back and tried to play the Seattle game, and just he was he was done after that. He, you know, two games or whatever, or did he miss that game entirely? Now I'm uh, I'm having second thoughts here. Let's see if I can pull this up really, really fast. Like, yeah, only one game last year, so uh, he wasn't he wasn't available at all, and it was a contract year, unfortunately. So he did he missed the New England game entirely, and then ended up leaving uh, the Seattle game or getting hurt <clears throat> after starting. So Sean Davis's career was kind of interesting too. I think it just showed them what they needed in so many different spots in that secondary because he started playing uh, right off the – well, here's the other thing with the top three picks because we'll, we'll be getting to the next guy, uh, Javon Hargrave. And, you know, he leaves during free agency here and gets a, a fat contract and for a hot minute he's the highest paid uh, nose tackle in the NFL going to the Eagles. But between those three guys, uh, Hargrave really, really broke the mold because in 30 years, the Steelers hadn't had a rookie starter on you know the opening day in 30 years on that defensive line. And to have any kind of rookie starters whatsoever in the defense at all was almost like unheard of for many, many years. And you know, I think some of that philosophy changed with Dick LeBeau leaving and uh, Keith Butler becoming the defensive coordinator in 2015. And I think uh, I think that helped even pave the way for some guys to obviously injuries uh, to Morgan Burnett ended up getting Terrell Edmonds in that spot, but TJ Watt jumps in immediately and starts playing. And you see some things like that start to happen. The same thing with Devin Bush last season. So uh, I think these guys really were kind of trailblazers in a, in an odd, odd roundabout way. Now, Sean Davis he ends up playing, um, if I'm not mistaken, maybe it was William Gay or there was somebody else. Maybe William Gay was playing outside to start the season in 2016. Sean Davis was playing nickel corner until Artie Burns started uh, starting games about six weeks in or so. And then I think they bumped Gay on the inside and shifted Davis, eventually went over to strong safety. And then when you're looking two seasons ago, then Davis goes over to free safety. And they're, you know, uh, the guy was versatile. Uh, it was like uh jack of all what was it jack of all trades master of none right pretty much that's kind of that's kind of where he was and you know i won't say he's below average or he sucked or he got beat or he got burnt even the same thing with burns uh, there's just a, it seems like with uh, cornerbacks and i know they're making fun of some of these guys like uh even like with the with the bengals um you know getting trey waynes i think they had a picture of burnt toast at a podium and they said he was doing his press conference i believe so it was it, you know it, it's brutal out there and not everybody is going to you know not everyone's going it, it's how what do i want to say a dog eat dog world so you're you're watching over your shoulder all the time until you're established. Like if Joe Hayden has a bad game, Joe Hayden's not going to lose his starting spot right away. But if you're dealing with a young guy who has very little of any kind of, I guess, equity buildup where you know, okay, well, he's been solid for you know several seasons and he has a bad game, there's no reason to pull him. This is kind of what ended up happening with Burns. Now, I think Burns was a good – and Davis too. All these guys, highly intelligent, very mature guys. They were uh, – I don't know about Burns specifically, but Davis was a sure tackler coming out of college. Um, you had Artie Burns was like a father figure, and he was a two-sport um, star in college too. He was also a track guy, and in high school, I believe he was an all-state track guy too. So you know, they, they had, Mike Tomlin and company. They like athletes. They like guys who are you know not. You see young players coming in, but young players who have a good head on their shoulders, and that's where Artie was. Unfortunately it kind of followed the same career trajectory as guys like before, like Cortez Allen, that he got like a big contract and all of a sudden it was, you know, it, it was in his head. It was his own worst enemy. He's there to maybe make a play, but doesn't make the play. And when those things start hurting your team, you're going to start losing playing time or be benched altogether. And that's unfortunately what kind of happened with Artie Burns here. And I know a lot of people will be like, I, I'm not going to throw around the B term. You know what it, it rhymes with rust uh, <laughs> that people will say with some of these picks, but uh, a lot of people will be like, well, this is why the Steelers have been so bad for so long. Well, they, yes and no. Okay, if you go back and you look, you're hoping to like cherry pick maybe 
uh, one or two guys, if you get any more than two guys that end up being four or five year contributors, I won't even say starters, uh, you know, the, the great makeup of your current roster is probably going to be players who have been in the league four years or less. That means guys who have been drafted usually in the last four years because they're on cheaper contracts and hopefully, hopefully you have a few other guys that have panned out and have been there. So when you go back and look, even 2015, uh, you know, you had Bud Dupree, Senquiz Golston, Sammy Coates, Duran Grant, Jesse James, LT Walton, Anthony Chicolo, Gerard Holloman. The only guy that's still left, Dupree. That doesn't necessarily mean it was a terrible draft. Jesse James and even Sammy Coates, for that matter, contributed quite a bit to helping this team win some games. You go back before that, like Ryan Shazier, Stefan Tuitt, Martavis Bryant. That was a really good draft. They still have Dan McCullers out of there. But even, even going back further to 2013, Jarvis Jones, okay, we could agree that that wasn't necessarily a great pick. Le'Veon Bell, Marcus Wheaton, Shamarco Thomas, Landry Jones, uh, Terry Hawthorne, Justin Brown, Vince Williams, and Nick Williams. And it's like, okay, Vince Williams, one of the rare late-round picks that has panned out and stuck around and carved out his niche with the team. And that's usually what you got. You got like one or two guys that are going to really uh, stand in there. And if you got at least that much and you don't blow it mostly at the top end of the draft, whether the guy's leaving free agency or not, your team's going to have some stability from year to year that you can continue to build on and be a contender. So I don't necessarily want to crap all over these guys, and particularly Sean Davis until he got hurt. That guy was in every single game. He didn't miss snaps. He never came off the field. He played every game. He was reliable. Um, and a few of the other picks that we're going to go through here too. So, But I think both of these guys that you kind of mentioned here, uh, Sean Davis doesn't get hurt. Maybe they don't Maybe they don't go out and get Minka Fitzpatrick. So Artie Burns, uh, you know, we got to get another guy to pair with Artie, or at least maybe we don't put all the pressure on Artie. He can't be our top guy. And then even to the fact of when Joe Hayden becomes available, now Joe's playing on one side of the field. He usually do, does not roam around. Very rare that you see that. So that kind of changes some of the def- defensive philosophy for the Steelers as well. And then when you realize, hey, we got to get somebody to replace Artie or Cody Sensabaugh, who was the guy replacing him, then you you go out and you make a move and get somebody like Steven Nelson. Lo and behold, look what you have now. You have a stocked secondary that's probably among the tops in the entire league. 100%. I mean, that's going back to the, the, the success rate of these drafts. I mean, I forget which uh, – it was one of the Cowboys' old executives from back during their 70s and 80s dynasties and 90s dynasties. You know, they wanted to – if you hit on 20% of your draft classes, you, you, not, you, you completely bust it out of the park. You know, it, realistically – Fans want every single pick to be a massive raging success. I think that the the overall success of your draft class is how you get in the first like first two picks. Typically, if you can get the first round pick, and obviously you know fans are going to remember the whole Jarvis Jones or uh, uh, yeah Jarvis Jones the debacle as a pick. They're going to remember that. Then you're going to remember the Artie Burns pick, and you know fans are already starting to clamor to Terrell Edmonds. But you have those three picks, but everyone sits there and says how the Steelers miss on their first round picks. But I just go back to. You know, 2010, Marquise Pouncey, Cam Hayward, David DeCastro, um, obviously Jarvis Jones 2013, Ryan Shazier before he got injured, uh, Bud Dupree, who fans were calling the bust, and now everyone wants to throw the money in the, in the Briggs truck at him. Um, Artie Burns, obviously, he's gone. TJ Watt, you know, potential defensive player of the year. Uh, Terrell Edmonds, I still think it's too early to dictate what his career trajectory is. He just finished his second year in the league, and because he's an all, not an all-pro doesn't mean he's a bust. And then Devin Bush, everyone's claiming for. So I, I, I struggle to see where the issues are, the Steelers' first-round picks, um, when it comes to that. Now, the depth of it, you're hoping you can find a Vince Williams in the sixth round or an Antonio Brown in the sixth round or a Daniel McCullers in the sixth round. Guys are going to be around as either role players or turning the studs down the road. I mean, even a guy like Kelvin Beachman in 2012 as a seventh-round pick who was an undersized tackle and not big enough to play guard. And, you know, he ends up stealing that left tackle spot. And if it wasn't for him injuring himself, um, in the year that Alejandro Villanueva was bust onto the scene, there's a chance that Calvin Beach is still the starting left tackle for the Steelers at this point, you know, and he, oh, yeah. and he, and he's gone up to a productive career with the Jets and he started almost every single game with them, you know, so he ended up having a great career. You know, you hope to get those guys in the end of the drafts that can really dictate how the class is going to look, but just because you don't nail on your fifth round pick or your fourth round pick or your seventh round pick doesn't mean the draft class is a bust because realistically those guys are going to be nothing more than high end depth role players that you can hope that, like you said, they're going to fill out your roster. They're cheap. They're inexpensive. They can play on special teams. Maybe they develop into an average starter who can hold the fourth down until you get a higher end prospect in their fill of shoes. But 
you know, getting a guy like Vince Williams in 2013 in the sixth round, who has plenty of starting experience and is a valuable backup at the minimum and realistically a very, uh, you know, above average starter, that you can't ask for anything else from a sixth round pick that for a guy playing a linebacker position in a way that we don't really see in the league anymore. You know, it was downhill thumpers, kind of not that athletic type of player. Um, so I think that kind of dictates how a lot of these classes go. And you're hoping that you can get 20% and get that first round pick nailed down. So I think the Steelers by and large have done a great job of under Kevin Culver. I mean, you have a couple classes where the players kind of pan out, but even going back to, you know, Troy, Ben Roethlisberger, Heath Miller, San Antonio Holmes, Lawrence Timmons. These are guys that are all first-round picks for the Steelers that went on to very great, solid careers, Super Bowl MVPs, passing league leaders, consecutive starters and team cap. You name it, they've done it. You know, I think the Steelers have done really well at identifying that. And But you have a class like the 2016 class now that I think is very reminiscent to an extent to like the 2009 and 2008 classes where you have guys that aren't making second contracts on your team that puts a huge hole in uh, in the system for long term. I think that's why you saw the Steelers have those back-to-back eight and eight seasons because that's when a lot of these guys from the 2008 and 2009 class are supposed to be in their prime, on their second contracts, really contributing for your team, and they didn't do that. And I think that's why the Steelers kind of went about handling this 16 class the way that they did by going out and getting a Steven Nelson, by going out and getting a Minka Fitzpatrick because when your top two guys are gone – those are now two guys you don't have. The deaf guys are all gone because, you know, now Medikevich is also gone. Tamarcus Ayers and Travis Feeney have been gone. They traded Hawkins last offseason. Like, the 16 class is a wash now. You know, Javon Hargrave is not no fault of their own. They're just going to afford to pay him what he wanted. And good for him. Hope him all the best with the Eagles. Um, but, you ha- but you had to cover your bases and make sure this class wasn't going to set your franchise back a couple seasons like the 2008 and 2009 classes did. And I think by getting guys like Nelson, like Minka Fitzpatrick, um, and even going after a guy like Terrell Edmonds in the first round, who they really shouldn't have needed, but they ended up needing safety at that point, I think really kind of fortified their ability. To, we're not going to go in, in that same process where we had two draft classes pretty much just be washes, and now we're trying to fill the gaps afterwards. So I commend them for that ability, but you're not going to hit every single pick. You're, it's just unfeasible. If that was the case, every single every single prospect, every single player on every team would be a Pro Bowl caliber player. It's just not feasible. You know, the Steelers have had a lot of success in the first round, and that's why a lot of the core of their team right now are former first-round picks. I mean, look at that defense. A lot of former first-round picks roving that secondary, roving that front seven. Um, you know, I just I think they do a great job at, at filling the needs with top picks um, and with the exception or the occasional miss with guys like Jarvis Jones and Artie Burns and what have you. They, by and large, do a good job. Was the Cowboys executive Gil Brandt by any chance? It was Gil Brandt. Yeah, Gil I can Brandt. Which yeah. The godfather of football, man. I mean, I love hearing his story. It seems like he's been in every single small town in America. If you've never okay. had a chance to listen to Gil, he's usually on late nights on Sirius XM radio, uh, for NFL radio, I should say. Uh, check it out, seriously. I mean, it's just, if you're a fan of football, I mean, I, I could center that guy's learning tree forever, and he's just, he, he's incredible. I, I don't know what else to say. I mean, he's done just about everything, too. He was a, he's an executive, he was a player, I mean, he was he was everything. Um, yep. <laughs> just interesting. Uh, interesting, interesting stuff, and also a pro football Hall of Famer, obviously. So um, the things he says, I like Bill Polian too, to a certain degree. I think Bill Polian's really to to the point, and even Pat Kerwin. These guys who used to be in an executive position or a general manager, they have a completely different, unique take on how all of this business stuff pans out. And they're you know they're going to tell you, hey, you're not going to hit on every single thing that you do in these drafts, and. You gave me a lot to chew on, a uh, chew off here. Uh, I'm going to try and jump around back and, and touch on some of your points, just like you did on mine. You know, <laughs> we both get <laughs> long winded, but I was going back to 2015, back in December, and who the Steelers had on the field. So you had Cam Hayward and Stefan to it. You had a nose tackle, Steve McClendon. Okay. Uh, your linebackers were Arthur Motes. Um, Shazier, Timmons, Jarvis Jones. You still had the rotation, though, with Bud Dupree and James Harrison. Uh, Sean Spence and Vince Williams were kind of even around at that point still, too. So when you're looking at the linebackers, they think, well, maybe we finally got this figured out. 
But the secondary was kind of a mess, uh, Zach. You had William Gay, Antoine Blake, Ross Cockrell, Brandon Boykin, and uh, and then you also had uh, – and Duran Grant, I guess, was uh, hanging around. I know he was an off-on guy, uh, one of the fourth-round picks. That I don't think he initially made the team or he was cut early, practice squad, et cetera, et cetera. And then they were rolling with Mike Mitchell, Will Allen, Shamarco Thomas, and Robert Golden. There's uh, some throwback names for you. So that tells you where, you know, they had a lot to work to do. Oh, that's what you were saying. You were talking about, like, the 08 draft. And not only that, a lot of those guys, like Ziggy Hood, Ziggy Hood was meant to – he was meant to be where Cam Hayward is right now, really. Um, and that kind of necessitated getting Cam Hayward a few years later because they realized Hood wasn't going to be the guy they thought he was going to be. But the Steelers also had to deal with retirements, too. And I know, and maybe some that were earlier or unexpected uh, than others. Obviously, they were probably looking at Casey Hampton eventually, like walking away. Uh, but they weren't expecting Aaron Smith to, you know, get hurt and retire early. They weren't expecting Troy Polamalu to be, you know, miss like half a season here or there uh, toward the end of his career. So that caused a lot of, you know, turbulence, especially when you have a, a lot of money invested in, or you have Pro Bowl or All Pro caliber players there. You're just you're trying to do your best to replace or shuffle or cycle or recycle some of those guys in and out you're not going you're not going to always do that all the time obviously Jarvis Jones's pick showed us that uh, it also shows that you know sometimes guys you get in later rounds aren't necessarily going to be the answer or free agents may not always be the answer as be the case with some of these other guys um, you mentioned Kelvin Beecham which is an interesting one too he's currently a free agent but and he's been pulling down about a nine and a half mil over the last two years with the Jets and we'll see if he ends up going back there or not uh, when we take a look at some of the other picks as we're going through this was round two and you are Already have let's see Sean Davis goes 58 so Mackenzie Alexander ends up going before that Tyler Boyd goes before that uh, then uh, you have some interesting stuff the very next pick at pick 59 after Sean Davis goes at 58 is Roberto Aguayo a kicker from Florida State if you everybody remembers him um, Cyrus Jones to the Patriots you talk about not being a sure thing or anything uh, Von Bell um, did Bell get signed yet I know he was looking to go somewhere maybe he oh I think he went to the Bengals too didn't he yeah he's, not, he, yeah, he's just signed by the Bengals the <laughs> day before yep so he's you know there, there you go he's off his rookie contract he's somewhere else James Bradbury I don't know is that a household old name uh, as a corner uh, the one I think maybe they I don't even want to say they, they missed here because are you looking at different needs when you look at a Sean Davis versus a Kevin Byard that's where I wanted to talk about with the Titans taking Kevin Byard oh six picks or so later you know that's the thing you got to ask yourself is this a guy that they had felt they they had a need for or did they even feel that Kevin Byard coming out of Middle Tennessee State was going to be better? You know, you talk about a lot of guys that are pro ready that play. You know, there's a guy that plays in the Big Ten when you're talking about Sean Davis. I understand it's Maryland, it's still Big Ten football, okay? So, you know, th these are all things that go into th these are the conversations that get had. And there, there's some other guys that end up going here uh, as far as secondary players or whatever. And you could always say, uh, coulda, woulda, shoulda, whatever be the case until you get into round three in that. Uh, obviously, if some of these guys end up going in round three, uh, you have like, like Kendall or Kendall Fuller or something like that. You have no idea how anybody's going to pan out. And as you continue to scroll down this list, you see a lot of contributors, but not necessarily anyone who jumps off the page as being like a Pro Bowl player. And I think a lot of that also has to deal with scheme and has to deal with fit with the team and everything like that. So, uh, But just in naming that, as I got into the third round, Zach, that's where Javon Hargrave, I think Javon Hargrave gave them a, a lot of different options too because I mentioned Steve McClendon. You may remember Cam Thomas. There was still a lot of 3-4 stuff going on there. And I know that you know football has really evolved over these last several years now where the Steelers sometimes, they only have maybe two defense of linemen out there and they're playing with like an extra DB or something like that uh, maybe a modified uh, nickel package dime package whatever that may be and they get a guy that's more position flexible like Javon Hargrave could give you different looks and you don't necessarily have to trot Dan McCullers out there to play you know a third or a half a game or anything like that so I think even though Javon and Javon certainly 
contributed to this team because where you didn't have maybe the turnovers or the splash plays you may have hoped with Burns or Davis. Uh, and I know Hargrave didn't have like a ton of sacks sometimes, but he, he put a lot of pressure on quarterbacks. He clogged up, uh, you know, gaps in the offensive line. He was able to come in and maintain that standard as the standard approach the Steelers have when Stephon Tuitt went down or when Cam Hayward got hurt. So, uh, you know, that's something else that they're probably, you know, they're, they're looking at right now. They're, they're evaluating that, having lost that, but you still have guys like Tyson Alou Alou. You have Chris uh, Wormley now who – I bet the Ravens are kicking themselves over this. So Michael Brockers, man. You talk about the physicals and everything that the virus is going through. There's a name right there. He was supposed to get signed with the Ravens, and now not only are they not bringing in a big name like that, now they also got rid of the guy that was like their depth guy or the guy they felt was expendable because of these free agent moves. And so there's another impact there. Although I'm not going to say I'm not going to shed a tear for the Ravens necessarily. And anybody who might be listening, that's a Ravens fan. Why are you listening? It's a Steelers podcast. What do you think I was going to say? You know what I mean? Steelers, Steelers, Steelers. I got to make sure I stay on Steelers. No pop culture references here. But yeah, uh, I think that's something that Javon Hargrave definitely – uh, that, that's definitely another dynamic that, that that was added here to the Steelers' defense in the way that it was, go, you know, going moving forward. Aside from the entire youth movement. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I, I, you know, it, it's it's tricky because every every draft is a puzzle, and that, you know, there's been a lot of going back and forth about whether or not you want to have free agency before the draft or vice versa, the draft for free agency. Um, I, I think it's easy to look back in hindsight and look at some of these picks that came after. You know, looking at Sean Davis and. You see a guy like Kevin Byard who's become a you know a perennial Pro Bowl, All Pro caliber safety. Um, you know, I, I think that kind of looks at it as a well, the Steelers should have gotten him. But there are two different types of players. The Steelers wanted a versatile defensive back like Sean Davis, who at Maryland had experience playing uh, single high free safety, he had experience playing strong safety in the box, he had experience playing nickel corner, slot corner, um, even a little reps outside corner. You know, it's like. That's what they wanted. Kevin Byard was a, was a was a safety. I mean, it, it, you can't look back and sit there and say they made the wrong pick just because we've seen one player become a, a, a premier safety in this league and one player who's on a second contract with another team on a kind of one year prove it type of deal. Um, it's all hindsight, and each draft comes together as a as a puzzle. You know, so now you have Javon Hargrave's gone, but they've done a good job, in my opinion, building a defensive line. Obviously, losing a guy like Javon Hargrave is going to hurt. Because in my opinion, he's one of the best nose tackle um, nose tackles in the league, and he's also one of the best uh, interior defensive line uh, pass rushers in the NFL as well. Outside of stands like Aaron Donald type of player. I'm not saying he's an Aaron Donald caliber player, but you get my <laughs> who is? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's just, he's just a very effective nose tackle that, at, at rushing the passer, and that's something that with that Eagles front seven is going to be very beneficial. Putting him next to guys like Fletcher Cox. Um, which just makes my my spine shiver thinking about what that defensive line is going to look like next year. But um, you know, I just I, I think it's all hindsight, and it's easy to sit back and sit there and say the Steelers made wrong picks or should have done could have done something differently. But it's all part of the puzzle when you're looking at it. And also, you know, you look at I'm just looking at the 16 class right now. I mean, you have guys that have um, have done well. Byard has done extremely well. Um, you have guys like Austin Hooper who now just signed his fat contract with the Browns. Um, and you're the highest paid uh, tight end in the league. He's made a couple of Pro Bowls. Um, you know, you got guys like Joe Schobert who fell to the fourth round of the Browns. He had made a Pro Bowl. Uh, you know, Dak Prescott in the fourth round, you know, trying to become the highest paid quarterback in the league. Uh, th- there's guys in every round that are going to be fantastic players. But for every player I see on here that's become a Pro Bowl caliber player, there's a bunch of guys who I don't even remember them ever making an impact outside of training camp. You know, it's like it, – it's all part of the puzzle of these draft classes are very volatile. You have some classes where there's a lot like the 1974 class type of deal where you got guys oozing out of every pick that seem to be an elite talent. And you got guys like the 13 class and the 16 class where there's guys that are struggling to make an impact with their team outside of the first couple picks. So it's all, it's all relative. Um, you know, these guys go on. Sometimes they, sometimes they don't produce on the rookie contract. And maybe there's some of these guys that we don't even know right now who are going to change scenery go to a different team and they're going to make a pro bowl because they just need to change the scenery, different coaching. Um, you know, we've seen guys like Dan McCullers do well with a different D line coach, not to take anything on coach Mitchell, but you know, different philosophies and different coaching styles work better for different players. And so far, Carl Dunbar, Carl Dunbar's uh, coaching philosophies just worked better for a guy like Dan McCullers. I know you and I have seen him in training camp yeah. and some of the 
as he comes in there and you know he's using his six foot seven 350 pound body much more effectively than he was with that and it's just his coaching philosophy it's not that Dunbar's a better or worse coach than uh Mitchell is but it's just different and it worked better for him and if he can come in there and he's not going to produce the same way that Javon Hargrave did but he's going to be a guy that can come in there and you know, not be a liability like he was his first two years, just standing upright, looking like a shade tree getting cut down. You know, it, it's uh, it, it's all relative. You know, it's they, these drafts aren't perfect. If they were perfect, it wouldn't be fun to me. I, I like the <laughs> idea of every single year and wondering which of these guys are going to be players we're talking about two, three, five, ten years from now, um, or guys that you know we're going to forget even existed after two years um, in this draft class. So I think it's what makes the draft special and what makes it interesting trying to look and see how these guys all pan out. Well, not only that, but you look at some of the things that do pan out. Uh, I'm going to jump over all the way down since I had it uh, on my screen. Uh, Tyree Kill, and he was taken in the fifth round uh, by the Kansas City Chiefs. You look at how far down he was pick 165, but he wasn't even the, the Chiefs' first pick in the fifth round. <laughs> <laughs> three three picks earlier, they take Kevin Hogan, quarterback, and you know he he had a cup of coffee in Pittsburgh. Uh, did, or no, I'm sorry, Kevin Hogan did not. Uh, I'm getting him confused with Brogan Roback. But Kevin Hogan's a guy, uh, you know, like journeyman type quarterback. You, you throw in, uh, you're giving a flyer on him. You know what I mean? Uh, he was in Cleveland. Uh, that's why I was thinking of that. I mean, who hasn't been in Cleveland as far as a quarterback, right? <laughs> Me and you may even get a shot there at some point. But yeah. I understand they have. <laughs> field right now just wait anyways <laughs> we'll see if they keep adding names to that jersey that goes all the way to the floor with the name plates but yeah it just goes to show you that nobody ever knows and there's always surprises here or there now gerald hawkins is a guy that they took that was kind of raw as a tackle out of lsu and then he got really banged up and became expendable due to other picks because you know that that ability that you have to have is called availability, and when you're not available, uh, your time is going to be very short. So they ended up getting there was like that twenty. It's not even for this year. It's 2021 draft where the Steelers swapped him in a pit in a seventh round pick for like the Buccaneers. Um, sixth or whatever and we're gonna see how that ends up working out that could be a really screwy bad trade now zach because tom brady's over there in uh in tampa bay so <laughs> now if they you know those picks may be closer together instead of further apart as maybe uh, previously envisioned but then again you know what maybe i'm giving too much credit where credit shouldn't be due Bruce Arians' quarterbacks usually uh, get killed. So we'll see if Tom Brady survives a full season <laughs> in a Bruce Arians offense. So, I mean, just look at what happened to Ben. Look what happened to Carson Palmer. Don't hate the messenger here, okay? Uh, <laughs> but Gerald Hawkins, hey, they at least got something back out of that. We'll, we won't know how that materializes yet for over well over another year, and then whatever pick – However, that works. Even if they trade that pick and move up, or actually draft somebody, you never. We have no idea. We'll look at it. We'll table it for five years, and we'll come back to it. Travis Feeney was the odd pick out of Washington because we didn't think he fit a three-four Steelers linebacker whatsoever, outside or inside. He was more like a four-three type guy, and that kind of that's what happened. I think he was the only guy of this draft class that didn't make the squad uh, outright, and I know he ended up in New Orleans for a little while and. Then you have seventh round flyers on Demarcus Ayers, who had a couple big plays. They won that one Ravens game just based off a of pass interference, and you know then he caught a pass from the goat Landry Jones in Week 17 against the Browns, a, a touchdown pass. And I also say he may have gotten involved in that Miami Dolphins playoff game later on too. I, I don't remember, but he he was a guy that bloomed late in the season and then was expendable due to how the plethora. I love the word plethora of wide receivers the Steelers had. You get to Tyler Matakevich, a guy that, you know, you see those gr circular graphs with everyone's athletic attributes, and his is just like a, a little ink <laughs> blot, like in the middle. But he's an, he was an instinctual football player with, uh, you know, good special team skills, and that's what they were basically they were looking at there as guys who could contribute there as well. And, you know, I think he had some accolades coming out of Temple too. I think he had, like, won a certain award or something like that and uh, was the leading tackler and four-year player and everything like that coming out of college. So he had some sort of pedigree even though you know he was like pick 246 and he just got a decent contract going to the Buffalo Bills so he actually got a second contract so you can't say that they, you know 
I don't like saying you miss on a seventh round pick anyways, but when you hit on one or somebody has a, a, a solid NFL career, a little bit of a feather in your cap, you should give yourself an attaboy and a, and a, a self high five. Uh, I think it's pretty good there, but you know, the, there's the other thing. When you look at these picks, you you tend to realize. I don't know the offensive line depth was necessarily much of a headache where Hawkins uh, had any damage or foresight. Really, those three defensive picks at the top is what really molded the defense. But Tyler Matikiewicz did too because. When Ryan Shazier went down, he wasn't really available, and the times he was available, you instantly realized that you had a, uh, what do you want to say, a hole on your defense, and it, they realized that they had to do something and try and get in, get somebody in there, and whether that was uh, a free agent or anything else, they tried that with like John Bostic, they tried to make some other different moves. This eventually, I think, ne- necessitated not only the Devin Bush pick last year, but uh, uh, the, all those things combined. Also, your man, Ulysses Gilbert, was brought right. in too. So they went a little double dip. They offered Vince Williams a, a contract extension somewhere in the middle of all this too before saying goodbye to uh, Lawrence Timmons ages ago as well. So these things constantly evolve. And you could t- now that you see the bigger picture of what we were talking about, certainly even though these uh, gentlemen aren't on the Steelers roster anymore, you could certainly see how they had an influence on how the team has been shaped and how that defense has grown over the last several seasons. Yeah, I mean, I, I see a guy like Tom Radikevich, you know, I, I don't think he was ever going to be, you know, the, the guy at Pittsburgh that you're you're plopping next to Ryan Shazier or, um, you know, Vince Williams and making giving yourself the slowest inside linebacker tandem in the NFL. You know, I think you're going to see a guy like him who had the intelligence, he was gritty. Um, I mean, he had all the offseason, postseason awards, um, when he was at Temple, you know, he's a guy that is just a lunch pail Pittsburgh Steelers type of linebacker. Maybe 20 years ago, he would be a premier type of player. Um, he just doesn't fit in today's league in that capacity. But he's a guy who was able to stick around as long as he was as a special teams captain because of the fact that, you know, he's getting down there. He's putting his head in, his hand in the pile and he's knocking heads around on special teams. I mean, that's what parlayed him into a two year, $9 million contract with the Bills this offseason. You know, he just, he's a guy that. You have to have valuable special teams players. I mean, the Steelers did the same thing with Derek Watt, who obviously he'll contribute on offense as a fullback, tight end capacity. Um, but his, his main meat and potatoes is going to be on special teams. He's replacing Matikavich and, to an extent, you know, uh, Rosie Nix. You know, so I, I think you can't undervalue those guys. And that's kind of what you're hoping to find with these seventh round, sixth round picks. You know, Vince Williams was really on that trajectory until he got forced into playing time as a rookie and he ended up starting 13 games. Um, because of just necessity, you know, so uh, he ended up carving out a role for him where he proved that he could play on this defense. He didn't have to just be a special teams guy because in reality, that's what he was coming out. He wasn't, if he was anything more, he would have gone sooner. You know, that's really where you're trying to roll out these, carve out these roles for these late round guys and hope you find an Antonio Brown or even a guy who can be a, a, a key return man, which is kind of where uh, I thought DeMarcus Ayers was going to fit with the Steelers. Is that it was going to be as a return guy. You know, he kind of served that role whenever he was with, uh, in Houston, at Houston, University of Houston. So I thought he would kind of fit that kind of niche there. Um, but that's, you're kind of, again, it's not a vacuum. You know, these all, each draft kind of stacks on top of each other, and it's kind of hard to evaluate what they look like and the importance of each one until you're at least five years outside of it. You know, we're getting to that point now with the 2016 class where we can finally start assessing what they were doing and how they kind of looked when they were there. And it's still too early to tell with classes like the 17 and 18 class because we still have no idea. You know, obviously you got a guy like T.J. Watt who's proven his abilities, but we still have to see what's going to end up happening with guys like you know James Conner and Juju Smith-Schuster and even a guy like Cam Sutton. You know, depending on what happens with them and their future with the team, we could be having this same conversation about the 17 draft class in 2022, depending on, you know, moves that have to be made because either the Steelers don't re-sign Juju or James Conner gets hurt again this year. or Cam Sutton takes a step back after we kind of saw him step into the spotlight a little bit with uh, increased defensive reps. It's hard to dictate because it's not a vacuum. Right now on paper, yeah, that 17 draft class looks great, but... It's only three years in the league. They're, they just finished their third season. It's way too early to dictate that. And we could be almost having the same conversation with Bud Dupree had Bud Dupree not made the same jump and not, not made the jump he made last year. Where we're sitting there saying, well, now they're going to draft an edge rusher, sure thing, first pick because of the fact that Bud Dupree didn't pan out. And it still might be a case where he leaves after this franchise tag if they don't get a long term deal done. 
You know, so again, these these drafts all stack on top of each other. Guys end up getting pushed into the limelight because of the fact that, you know, they ended up having to step in for a player who either didn't develop the way the team thought they would. He got hurt. A guy like Ryan Chazier, who was on his way to a defensive player of the year type of season, who got hurt. And now that led to Devin Bush being selected. Ulysses Gilbert adding some athleticism on the middle. Vince Williams ended up stepping up to the plate in a more feature role. They signed a guy like Mark Barron. They tried to test the waters to see if a guy like, uh, uh, Sean Spence could come back and contribute. You, you see the, the the cascade effect of one one miss or one injury or one guy who doesn't develop the way you want him to can impact future draft classes and how you attack free agency, especially as a team like the Steelers that don't over the top spend in free agency. You know, so it's it's what makes teams teams, and you know the teams that can navigate those waters effectively are the teams like the Steelers who are consistently there. You know, they're consistently competitive. They're consistently putting their hands in their in in the ring and saying we're going to be a competitive team that's trying to compete for a Super Bowl. Um, and you see teams like the Browns, teams like the Jaguars, teams like that that you know sometimes maybe they'll catch lightning in a bottle and be half decent. And yet most of the time they're looking at top ten picks. You know because if you look at every single draft class, it's typically this, there's the, there's a couple teams that are perennial perennial top fifteen picks. They're perennially changing their front office. They're perennially changing their coaching staff. And that comes down to how they uh, how they look at these draft classes. You get, like, could another team with another front office be able to like, navigate the two thousand eight two thousand nine draft classes aftermath the way the Steelers did? I don't know. I think a lot of that comes back to giving Kevin Colbert the credit that he doesn't often get to you know saying we screwed this one up. And even then, they, you know, Ziggy Hood went on to a productive career. He was playing as recently as two years ago, a year ago. You know, so he's had a productive career. And obviously, Rashard Mendenhall, you know, kind of fell down to earth very quickly. But again, he's a running back. It's not unforeseen territory to see a running back have a short career. You know, so I just it's all relative. And I think the Steelers don't get nearly enough credit for the work that they're able to do to to find diamonds in the rough late in the draft that can come and contribute. I mean, you have guys in even recent classes. I mean, Ulysses Gilbert, like you mentioned, um, an athletic guy who before he got hurt last year was a, becoming a special team standout, which is probably another reason why they felt comfortable moving on from Tyler Medikevich and not trying to maintain his stature there. Um, you have a guy like Jalen Samuels as a fifth-round pick who's become a valuable special teams contributor and an uh, offensive rotational piece. Uh, you know, it, it's all it's all relative. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about well, it. Well, you know? yeah, and I think this is the big one. As uh, as you were talking, I, I did some math and stuff over here, and uh, – just to also let you know, too, Derek Watt was also, what, a sixth-round pick out of that same 2016 draft. So, uh, But you take a look at everyone. I went from Kevin Byard, uh, so there were 63 picks before Kevin Byard. Out of a total of, let me see, let's see, 253 players taken in the 2016 draft. There were 190, including Byard and after. How many of them do you think ever made a Pro Bowl? I'm going to go uh, through them. You may be looking uh, at the same list. I just off the top of your head because I know you're probably I'm, looking I'm gonna, at it. I'm going to say like five. Well, you know what? That's a pretty good guess, actually. I, I came up with nine. So you have Bayard, yeah. you have Yannick Ngakwe, Austin Hooper, Joe Schobert, Pharaoh Cooper, who did so uh, as a special teams uh, as a returner, Dak Prescott, Matt Judon, Jordan Howard, Tyreek Hill is the last one on the list at pick 165. No one else after that. And he was near the bottom of the fifth round before compensatory picks. No one in the sixth or seventh round of that draft. No one. Not out of any of the 32 teams or any of the other picks made a Pro Bowl. That just kind of tells you how things shake out. And it, it's 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 slim. It's slim and it's rare. So uh, just when everybody's looking for that next superstar, it doesn't always turn out that way. And I know we talked about the top of the first round, and if we look at some other uh, drafts, they don't necessarily turn out just just as good. But those, you know, the first two rounds, your first two days of the draft, I mean, that's really where you're making your hay. And then uh, maybe some others – end up uh, you know being those diamonds in the rough that you were talking about but i digress we're up against it i hope this gave some different perspective on this 2016 steelers draft class that's no longer with the pittsburgh steelers and you know there's a lot of different things that ended up shaking out from this so uh zach i wanted to thank you once again for uh joining me today even though you're in a world of isolation as well i always appreciate hearing you and having you on with me i always appreciate joe another good one in the books 
Absolutely. So folks, uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Even if I don't like your comments, you know, especially if you're not a Steelers fan, I'll tolerate you a little bit if you are. Uh, the other folks, you know, if you're going to troll, I, I troll right back with the best of them. So as does Brian. <laughs> so anyways, um, my name is Joe. His name's not Brian. His name's Zach. And uh, we thank everyone for listening and always encourage our listeners out there to be safe, be good, and we'll catch you later. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com. 